Vaughn, Program Manager for the Digital Equity Research Center at Metro. Welcome to the first session in the Built to Last series, co-hosted by the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society, the Centra Tech Foundation, and Metro. As you uh, get settled in, a few logistical notes. First, the event is being recorded. We will email a link to everyone who registered for today's event before session two tomorrow. It'll also be available on metro.org in the coming days. Second, please put any questions you have for our panel into the Q&A box rather than the chat as we go. We'll have a few minutes for our speakers to respond to questions after their discussion. Third, a note about our speaker lineup. Matthew Rantanen is unable to join us today, but will be here on Thursday for the discussion about the future of digital equity. We're excited to welcome Greta Byram as the third panelist for today's discussion. And finally, we'll be sharing the links to everyone's biographies and to our event code of conduct in the chat so that you have them on hand. So I'm pleased to introduce Nate Hill, Executive Director of Metro, who will kick things off. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Nate Hill, and I am the Executive Director of the Metropolitan New York Library Council, lovingly referred to as Metro for short. Uh, Metro is an independent nonprofit library agency that was chartered by the New York State Board of Regents in 1964. Our mission is to create a sustainable culture of creativity, collaboration, and open exchange for libraries, archives, museums, and cultural institutions in the metropolitan New York region and around the world. We accomplish our mission through leadership, grant making, resource sharing, professional learning, research, software services, creative practice, and more. I am incredibly grateful for the opportunity to partner with the Century Tech Foundation and the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society on this important program series. Additionally, I'm delighted to introduce to you Dr. Colin Reinsmith, the founder and director of the Digital Equity Research Center here at Metro. Colin, sincere thanks for everything that you do. Um, I'll let you take it from here. All right. Thank you so much, Nate. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for joining us for this first in our three-part series, Built to Last. Uh, I am so excited to be here. Uh, over these next three days, we will have a really incredible opportunity to discuss what building for the future looks like based on what we've learned from the past and what's happening in this current moment of unprecedented support for digital equity. But before we begin, I just want to say a quick thank you to some people who made these events possible. Uh, first, I want to thank you, uh, Becca Kwan at the Digital Equity Research Center, uh, and Kendra Hills at the Century Tech Foundation, who played major roles in helping pull these events together. I also want to thank our amazing events team here at Metro for their support with these events. And of course, a huge thank you to the Century Tech Foundation and the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society for being such amazing co-organizers of these events with us. Now, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce Marta Urquia, founding president of the Century Tech Foundation. A true veteran in this space, Marta has over 25 years of experience managing programs and leading results-oriented policy approaches to improve lives. Before joining CTF, Marta was Chief Program Officer at Education Design Lab, directing the creation of new education models toward the future of work. Previously, she was Deputy Director at the Beak Center for Social Impact and Innovation at Georgetown University, where she led efforts to build the next generation of leaders and approaches to scale social change. Under President Obama, Marta served as Senior Policy Advisor in the White House Office of Social Innovation, and civic participation, and as senior advisor for social innovation at the Corporation for National and Community Service, where she built and implemented the first social innovation fund in the US government, a model adopted across federal agencies. Welcome, Marta. Thanks so much, Colin. If I could ask for the slides to come down as we bring folks on. Thank you all today for joining us. Good afternoon and welcome to Learning from the Past, Community-Led Strategies for Digital Equity. 
In this afternoon's discussion, you will hear about successful efforts in years past that have enabled the creation of digital equity ecosystems in their communities and continue to drive social impact today. Joining us for today's panel are um, several digital equity experts who have been leading efforts to expand digital access and adoption on the ground in places from Detroit to Philadelphia to New York City and beyond for well over a decade. And following this panel discussion, you will hear from digital equity researcher Karen Mossberger, who will serve as today's respondent. And with that, I'd like to welcome the panelists into the conversation and introduce them to you. Also, the um, bios for all our speakers, I believe, will be made available through a shared link. Um, starting with Juliette Fink Yates. She has been working to address digital equity since 2001, when she was managing a small ISP for 10,000 low-income Philadelphians without internet access for the Critical Path Internet Project. For many years, she worked as the Chief Learning Officer at Philadelphia Fight Community Health Centers at the intersection of adult education, technology, and healthcare. In 2010, she wrote in collaboration with the City of Philadelphia, the Broadband Stimulus Grant that brought 5.4 million to low-income communities to set up computer labs, which became known as Key Spots in 77 lo locations reached out to cultivate the key partners involved in that grant and helped to design the program structure, overseeing a team that managed 28 of those key spots. Juliet was a founder of the Technology Learning Collaborative, Philadelphia's first professional development organization dedicated to digital literacy providers and advocates, and was a member of the City of Philadelphia's Digital Literacy Alliance until she joined the City of Philadelphia's Office of Innovation and Technology as the first digital inclusion fellow. In her current role as Broadband Infrastructure and Digital Inclusion Manager for the city, Juliet works collaboratively across departments and with local partners to create the city's digital equity plan and to manage a portfolio of programs that will help carry out that plan. Welcome, Juliet. Our next panelist is Greta Byram, who is an urban planner specializing in broadband technologies and tech policy equity and governance through program design and collaborative action research. She serves as principal for the Broadband and Digital Equity Principal at Ancient RNA Advisors and is an Opportunity Fund Fellow with the Benton Institute for Broadband and Society, where she focuses on digital safety and security in the context of the Digital Equity Act. Previous to her work with HRNA and Benton, Greta built the Resilient Communities Program at New America, an initiative bringing storm-ready mesh networks to five environmental justice communities in New York City. She founded Community Tech New York, a nonprofit organization bringing technical assistance and community organizing support to communities in New York, Detroit, and rural Tennessee. She also co-founded the Digital Equity Laboratory at the New School and stood up the Just Tech program at the Social Science Research Council. Greta lives in the beautiful Hudson Valley. Welcome, Greta. Monique Tate is a director for Community Tech New York, educating community wireless network advocates and enthusiasts across the country, in addition to lecturing in Canada and Germany. She began her work in this field in 2011 and continues implementing broadband sharing in Detroit and New York. She has introduced thousands to community technology and recruited and educated hundreds in digital stewardship community leadership, community networks, and digital justice coalition building. Monique is co-chair of the City of Detroit Go Data Advisory Commission. In 2016 to 2020, she deployed and managed the largest community network in Detroit for the Equitable Internet Initiative with nine relay sites, three solar powered Wi-Fi and charging stations and activated the first Detroit public park, Bennett Playground with Wi-Fi serving thousands. This community network is still growing today. Welcome, Monique. So we have a wonderful set of speakers joining us today for this conversation. And with that, I would like to just dive right in. Um, I do wanna note uh, that Greta will be, um, will be leaving the panel uh, just shortly before five and I will make time for questions for Greta before she goes. So let's just begin by talking about where things stand today. And then we can go back to the beginning. But I think it's important for us to just start with this current state, this current moment, and what is the state of play with regards to federal investment for digital equity 
as each of you sees it, like what's happening right now that's most salient for folks to understand? And what are some of those challenges and opportunities that are presenting themselves? And we'll go ahead and start with you, Juliet. Sure. Thanks, Marta. Um, and thanks for having me here today. Um, so I think where we are right now is in a very important moment. So there's enormous amount of federal investment, um, particularly related to both treasury funds and um, capital project, project funds and also bead funding right now. Those funds have gone to states, directly to state governments and to state broadband offices to figure out what to, um, how they intend to use that funding. And right now we're in this moment where they are putting together the plans to submit to the NTIA um, for how they are gonna use these funds. Um, and so there's a moment where you can comment and you can influence right in this moment how that looks. Um, they are also required to work on digital equity plans um, and there will be commenting periods and process from the state around those plans. But I think where the challenges are here is, is in for urban environments that you know typically have lots of fiber underground and where there is um, where they may not seem that, where it seems in the context that they are served, that very little of that money, I think people don't realize, is and is going to end up in urban environments, um, if any of it. Um, and so the real challenge, as I see it right now, is um, how to work collaboratively with folks across the state to inform the state's plans that will lift all boats. So even if they are addressing networks across in, in rural areas, that that changes the paradigm that impacts urban areas too. And so that's some of the challenge and some of the opportunity I think we have in this moment. Thank you. I'm gonna go to you, Greta, next. What would you add to that? Thank you so much. And um, I just wanted to say, um, how honored I am. Um, you know, I think all of us go back to the BTOP and some of us way before um, in doing this work. And I can think of, you know, really specific and, you know, life-changing things I've learned from Juliet and from Monique and from Karen um, and Marta. I'm learning from you all the time. So um, this is really a field that is full of relationships and of people who've been working together for decades. Um, and I think it's really important to call on the knowledge, the historical knowledge that we all have in this space. And, um, you know, we've we've been through a lot together <laughs> and there's a lot we can learn from the BTOP, the Broadband Technology Opportunity Program which uh, was the previous stimulus funding package uh, for broadband and digital equity. Uh, and I think it, it was 2009 to 2012 or 13. Um, so there were a lot of learnings from the BTOP. And one of them was that, you know, the BTOP was really directed towards um, urban areas. And I think in sort of response to that, when we got to this current kind of crisis cycle of investment in this area following the pandemic, that there was a need to look also at, at rural areas in terms of, you know, their needs for this investment. And I think, you know, we're seeing that it, this is always a really complicated question of how funding gets allocated across different geographies. So I just want to underscore what Juliet said in terms of coming together, finding folks who have been in this space for a while and being strategic about um, how folks are reading and commenting on digital equity plans and the initial proposals. So that is the moment, as Juliet said, we're in the process, most states, um, Many states have plans open for comment right now. Um, it's a great time to talk with folks in your communities and across your states. Um, and if if there's a lot of lingo in there, because I know there is, <laughs> to like find someone who knows the language and, you know, we're friendly, we're around, we want to talk to you. And I think states really want to talk to folks as well. So 
this is an open moment um, and if we're looking to have dialogue, we should all be, you know, figuring out what's the way to lift all boats. That's great. I think it's it's really important to to call out that action that can be pursued right now via public comment. Monique, I want to bring you into this. Um, from your vantage point, how would you describe the current state of play? Oh, you're on mute. Okay, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, I was saying absolutely, and I too say thank you so much for uh, the invitation, for bringing us here and together. And as uh, Greta stated, it is nice to be with the comrades uh, that we've been standing on both the um, in the trenches as well as on the mountaintops with. So uh, great to be here. Um, in that, I, I will say that both Juliet and Greta gave an excellent state of play as to where things are and where we are today. So I'll just um, quickly touch on the challenges so we can also get into the meat of, I'm sure the other questions that you have in mind. And that is um, the challenges are about the public comment and these periods of time that we are in that are so rushed in order to meet these deadlines. I mean, they have deadlines to get submissions, they being the states, to get submissions in um, by the end of the year. Um, but they want to try to have these plans looked at. That's where the challenge is. We need to utilize every aspect possible to inform community residents about, give them a, a summarized version. Yes, it's gotta be the cliff notes because it's a 200 plus page document. So those of us who are engaged in going to read the entire thing, get our cliff notes together and mention it to everyone so that they have an idea. Encourage them to either attend your um, if your state, I'm, I can speak for New York, is having any kind of virtual session, encourage them to be a part of it. But also two states, don't forget, we're talking to the population that is unconnected. So everything cannot be digital. There must be on the ground um, opportunities to communicate. So community anchored organizations, uh, community, block clubs, networks, associations, anyone that you can talk to and get a few minutes on their calendars to just say, let me give you this quick overview about this state digital equity plan. And now tell me what you think. What, 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 what did we miss? What do you need? That's where we really need to be because we have the advocates involved, but we have to get the people involved. That's the challenge. Yeah, that public comment without engagement doesn't really get us what we hope it will. Thank you for pulling that up. So so let's walk back um, to the historical um, aspect of the conversation. So we have already you know, established, we've got fellow comrades in the mix here um, who have traveled on this journey, going as far back as the B-top, which Greta just mentioned, you know, was playing out between 2009, 2012, and 2013, and some even before. Um, you know, you've all been in this work in some way, shape, or form. Maybe where you stand today is different from where you began, as we heard in your bios. But let's let's just talk through it. So we know that BTOP is the Broadband Technology Opportunities Program, which was a federal program that was investing in digital equity. You all were a part of efforts that participated in BTOP um, and, and shepherded some of that, um, you know, what people are living through right now. Um, and, and I think it's important to explore that. So let's talk about one, what is it that each of you pursued to do with BTOP with your um, communities and, and allies? Um, and then what, what were the challenges that you confronted in pursuing that funding? And maybe we could do just a quick um, go around, starting again with you, Juliet. Sure. Um, so I think Philadelphia was in a um, particularly interesting place when BTOP came out. And it's because we had at the time a mayor who took on this challenge and made it a real signature initiative to create something called Wireless Philadelphia. People don't love that I bring this up all the time because it actually did not work. But what it did do was it sort of threw down a gauntlet that said, we're going to try to cover the city in um, home internet that's a low cost for everybody, right? It was a very early attempt at that. And the reason it didn't work is, is you know, there's a lot of things that went into that. There's papers that were written about it. But what it did do was it brought together when it failed a bunch of advocates who were working with it and who cared about this deeply. And those folks got together 
um, and started to meet to think about BTOP funding. And so it, it kind of, we were in this place where we already kind of had some community of, of digital inclusion practitioners and advocates who are kind of working in this space. And what we did was um, kind of create a, we applied for two components of the funding. We applied for um, public computing centers and then digital literacy programming. We tried to apply for infrastructure funding and did not get far with that largely because e even the BTOP was meant for urban areas, we were still seen as served. And so infrastructure funding for municipalities has been really, really difficult to come by, um, even in that BTOP era. Um, and so because we had these advocates, we were able to um, get these two funding streams It brought, I think, almost $10 million to the city of Philadelphia. We had about 10 lead partners of community organizations, the free library government, the city led one of those led one of those initiatives and then a, another nonprofit led another initiative, but we all worked collaboratively um, on the funding that was pursued. Um, and we put together applications that um, mirrored each other and aligned with each other as much as we could, and then brought in community organizations, about another 50 community organizations that got a certain amount of money to do some of the program at those at their local organizations kind of across the city. So we really did try to cast this very wide net um, for the BTOP funding. Um, and I think that the, 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 there was a lot of success in that work, um, huge amounts of success. So many wonderful things came out of that. We stood up all these public computing centers. We had this amazing training boot camp program. We like learned all about this, these amazing digital inclusion programs and literacy, digital literacy programs that people were doing out there. Um, so we, I think, took it pretty far. One of the challenges that with that funding that we had was um, really that, um, it was only technically two years. And to do really big programs like this, it takes a year and a half just to get them started. <laughs> and then suddenly you're trying to wind them down. And so I think that, that one of the challenges was even just sort of understanding how long it takes to implement, to get things up to like full implementation mode. Um, and then the other challenge that I'm sure we're gonna hit more is like what happened and what happens after that funding. So I'll pause there um, to give you an overview of what we did, how we got there um, and let others talk a little bit about their programs. All right, Monique, let's hear from you and your BTOP experience. My BTOP experience actually overlaps with Gladys. I'm gonna leave her some space. Well, my, well, we can well. weave in and out. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I initially met her. But I will say that for Detroit, we had some very unique circumstances going on at that time um, because we were just coming out. I can't even say coming out of the Great Recession because, of course, you know, the auto industry was at stake and that's our livelihood here. And um, our housing, we had a terrible housing crisis where we had over 60,000 homes that were slated for foreclosure. And um, and then amongst that, we with the significant uh, layoff, then our city, of course, did a precedented thing and filed bankruptcy because all of those things were coming together. So we were in a state of emergency all the way around. So my experiences with BTOP were twofold. One, I worked with a project um, that was the um, Connect Your Community project, which were the beginnings of like NDIA to this day. And that was all about digital literacy. Um, but I also had the pleasure of being introduced to Allied Media and the um, what is now known as the Detroit Community Technology Project, but we operated under Allied Media because I wanted to find a way to get free internet for my community, shared internet. I said, there's some people somewhere talking about, you. we can get internet uh, together as a group. And um, because I've been a community activist for over 30 years, and that's really what sparked my interest. And I then entered in um, the groundwork that uh, Greta Diana, and Diana Nucera and others were putting together for the digital stewardship program. Let's teach people how to build their own internet, not just feed them for a day, but 
teach them how to fish or in our case, build our own internet so we could uh, sustain and survive from that period. So the, um, I can't say anything about the background of the funding. I can just say that I'm a product of its um, development and its evolution and showing that touching into community and getting people involved with just even understanding about the necessity of internet was key to my development to this day. And um, that's why I am very motivated to speak to community members because there are many, many, many others just like me who have been leaders um, because communities are led internally. They're not led externally. And if you don't tap into the right sources and people, you're never gonna get through. So um, my BTOP days were great in terms of making sure that the overwhelming request for digital literacy was met. And when I say overwhelming, it was overwhelming, especially seniors. We had um, thousands of people trying to get trained and it helped also to speak, and this will be my last statement, to the disparity that sometimes government believes, oh, they're not interested. No, no, nobody really wants this thing. Yes, we did. And we showed up in droves, um, identifying that we wanted equipment to be able to work, to work on the internet. We wanted an internet connection at a reasonable price, affordable price. And we wanted digital literacy skills in order to know how to use these new tools. Thank you for that. And thank you also for just kind of setting the stage even more so, right, with the external conditions that were impacting what was happening in the moment economically. But also 2009 was just one year after the introduction of the iPhone, right? And it was a new presidential administration that was also championing technology. So that was really a moment that was happening for the country at that time. Greta, let's hear from you. Great. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like I met, I sort of alluded to this before, but we have seen digital equity funding come in crisis cycles. And so, you know, we've talked about, uh, you know, the financial crisis that preceded the BTOP and now the pandemic which preceded uh, this funding opportunity in the middle. There was uh, Sandy funding for New York City um, post Sandy funding. Um, and so, we sort of see these opportunities come up in these kind of unpredictable cycles that are tied to um, other kinds of hardship happening in communities. Um, and so, yeah, um, all of us, you know, Monique and Juliet were part of my daily life. <laughs> Back in 2012, I was at New America's Open Technology Institute at the time, and um, we were working on evaluation, independent evaluation projects for both Detroit and Philadelphia. Um, and Colin Reinsmith was actually working with us as well. Um, and Colin, working with the Free Library of Philadelphia, um, developed a super interesting and amazing um, hypothesis, which was sort of borne out by the data, which was to say that you know, whereas the kind of goal of the BTOP and the success metric of the BTOP was how many people were subscribing to home internet, Colin showed that um, that equally, if not more important, was how people were coming together in person in the libraries um, to be among peers where they felt comfortable and supported um, by the people around them. So they were coming online together. Um, and I think that is a finding that we kind of return to over and over and we keep learning this lesson that it's not really true that if you build it, they will come. So, you know, you can build networks forever. Uh, but what matters is that people feel safe and comfortable. Um, and I think as we're looking at new adopters, people coming online right now, we're seeing the same thing. And especially in an era where safety, security, privacy are are really huge concerns for a lot of people. Um, you know, there's just a lot to unpack there. Um, and I feel like we keep having to relearn and kind of reteach this lesson of, hey, like networks aren't going to on their own get the job done. And, and we know that viscerally, I think all of us here, we know this so well. And this is, you know, one reason that looking at the way the funding for the IIJ has broken out, which is just hugely disproportionate in the direction of funding infrastructure and much, much less 
um, you know, it's billions and billions of infrastructure. And, um, you know, in most cases, states are getting below, you know, 80, 50 million for um, digital equity programs like skills and um, devices. So just naming that off the top. And then the last thing I want to say is, um, I think that the National Telecommunications Information Agency, which is the part of the Commerce Department that has been administering these programs, they've done something really interesting, in, both in the VTOP and in the Digital Equity Act of today, which was they they required that states or you know potential applicants, cities um, had people come together in coalition in order to apply in the case of VTOP. And then with the Digital Equity Act, um, there's, you know, the, the law actually says states have to uh, talk to people who are most affected by digital inequity and that solutions must be built out of partnerships. Um, so that, again, this is not just about funding state programs. This is about people coming together and building these these long term relationships who really understand what's at stake. Um, so, yeah, so I just a, a little props out to um, our friends at the NTIA for for really thinking about social fabric as part of this work. Thank you for that. And I think you all have, I just want to name some of the things you've been calling out as we've been talking. I mean, first of all is, yes, there's public comment. It's a great way to engage. However, you know, there's still a bridge to be built from, you know, inviting public comment to actually making people aware. So there is an outreach and organizing um, activity that is much needed at this moment. And then also, again and again, we've heard about lifting all boats, collaboration, relationship building, working in unison, and even NTIA underscoring that in this iteration of funding, federal funding, with a call for cross-sectoral approaches. I think important also to note the role of champions um, at the um, seizing of the moment, right? When when out of crisis comes opportunity, uh, and then you know some of the things that that you know could could not be achieved by way of VTOP. First, we heard it was her, you know difficult to get infrastructure money out of VTOP in the case of Philadelphia, and now we're in this current moment that seems like it's over privileging the infrastructure spending over you know the adoption piece, which at the end of the day is the glue that has to hold it all together and deliver on you know what does this mean in the lives of people. So I want to dig into that as communities are moving forward now um, to pursue this digital equity funding. And we're trying to think about long-term digital equity solutions. How do we get to lasting value? You know, based on your experiences, what you lived then and what you're seeing now, can we probe a bit? Because if there is a gap in funding for, let's talk about the urban environments where we know there, there is still acute, you know, uh, lack of access um, and cities as big as New York City getting slated to get zero dollars, right? And then we know that there is much more money for infrastructure than there is for the actual adoption side of it. Who's going to pay for this? right, is a question I have. And also like where the money's not gonna be available, who's gonna pay for that? Who's gonna make that happen? Who's gonna, the marketing and outreach you're talking about, Monique, how's that gonna get supported and you know made possible? And I think too, you know, this piece that you raised, Juliet, around the need to engage with the states and with other communities within the state to make sure that the cities aren't left out you know, that's kind of calling into question like the role of government. So let's just walk through. I'd like to start with Juliet, the role of government. You started this work outside of government. You work in government now. You have a point of view. What do you see as the role of government in this moment? So I think that um, obviously the role of state government, there's a little bit of difference. I just want to like acknowledge state government versus municipal government because the state government's going to get all this money, right? So they have like a very particular role in figuring out how to dole it out equitably, right? Um, I also want to acknowledge that um, the as I, as I started out in, in the nonprofit sector in, you know, as more of an advocacy role, 
it is, um, there are things that you can do in that environment that you can't do inside government, right? So you have a voice as a nonprofit advocate that you can state really loudly, you know, something that you want really clearly that it's possible the government may never be able to do, but if, you, and, and they may never be able to state it. So governments tend to be like very careful about what they can commit to doing um, unless there's real, um, leadership from the mayor or city council to say, like, we're going to try to figure out how to get it done. Right. And so, um, you know, those priorities really come down. So everybody else kind of in government um, is trying to either kind of push up like this is important, like let's like make figure out how we can raise it, how we can lift it. Um, but depending on sort of who's the leader. And, and you've seen differences in this across governments, across the pandemic, where some sort of like, we're building a network and we're doing it. And some were sort of like, we're gonna get all K-12 connected, right? And that was the focus, right? So it really depends on kind of what the leadership is saying in government. The other thing about what happens in government is that there's a lot of departments. So in my role in government from the inside, you know, the Free Library of Philadelphia is part of our government. All the parks and rec facilities are part of our government. Office of Adult Ed, you know, Office of Children and Families, um, Streets Department, if you're talking about infrastructure, all of these are massive departments that you have to like work through to like figure out how to accomplish these different particular goals. And I know it sounds like like lots of, I mean, we talk about bureaucracy all the time and, you know, there's amazing people working in government, working on many, many initiatives, but sometimes it is really hard to kind of like move things through um, or that governments, you know, sometimes can't just like, they have a budget, they have a five, we have a five-year budget. I can't just request money to be moved just because we need this particular thing at this moment. So there are real limitations around what, government, I think, can can do and say, which is why sometimes when advocates are like, why are you so cautious? Why can't you just like spend the money and build out a network? I'm like, I don't have, I can't like raise it to the issue where I can just get $40 million to create a municipal network. That's a lot of money. So, you know, the there is a amazing push pull and that's why we have to work like in community and like work with partners in community because it's really important for folks outside of government to be able to kind of raise these issues and you are always trying to negotiate around like how do you get there and how you can successfully meet and achieve the things that you want to achieve together is ultimately what i think we're trying to do i mean we are in this moment too where I just add that for the first time, municipal governments have positions like mine in the city government. And that didn't happen until recently. That is a very, very new phenomenon. So digital equity was not something that there was even a position for. Um, and now what you're seeing is municipal governments all over the place finally have a person. Sometimes if they're lucky, they have more than one person working across the government to figure out how to address these issues. Prior to the past like two, three years, almost no municipal government had a person who was even focused on this. Yeah, no, thank you for reminding us of that. You know, it, it definitely is a new a new development that, that we're glad to have. Um, I'd like to move to Greta and ask you, Greta, I mean, so there's the government side. Let's, what's your view on philanthropy and, and where philanthropy should come in here in this space? Yeah, I'm happy to speak on that as, um, you know, someone who was in the nonprofit world for a long time and um, had a lot of philanthropic relationships. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing before I dive in there is just that um, when we talk about New York City or Philadelphia not getting any funding, we're talking specifically about bead funding, which is the side of the infrastructure uh, investments that is just about building networks themselves. Um, cities are um, in line to receive digital equity funds in many cases, um, but it's just way less money, <laughs> like way less. <laughs> so I think, um, you know, it, I think people rightfully, you know, object that people in cities also have difficulty accessing networks. Um, and so that is, you know, 
one of the types of issues that people could conduct advocacy around. Um, I'll also name, you know, within the Digital Equity Act, some of the other things that are top issues have to do with device access. Um, you know, so just making sure everybody has the devices they need that meet their needs, um, skills and literacy, which um, that is everything from, hey, can you, um, are you comfortable um, working with video chat so that you can do telehealth, so that you can do remote learning, um, you know, everything from that to like, are you worried about doing your banking online? Is it, you know, do you feel concerned about your safety? Um, to, you know, all the workforce skills, like there really aren't jobs anymore where you don't have to work with technology in some form. And then finally, um, you know, aside from I mentioned safety um, and security, this is a huge concern and rightfully so people feel scared that their if their identity is going to be stolen, that they're going to be scammed and hacked. Um, and then finally, accessibility. So making sure that stuff that's on the web, that people can use it, <laughs> that it works, that it's navigable. Um, so these are all areas where, you know, I would encourage folks to, like Juliet was saying, to to actually tell government what you what you need in those particular areas. Um, those are the things that are fundable under the Digital Equity Act, um, the primary things. Um, as far as kind of how the sectors come together, um, I'll, with my consultant hat on, I will say that there's an opportunity here for the private sector to come together with communities and um, create, you know, meaningful um, partnerships that really do serve the communities. Um, you know, and negotiate those partnerships, make them meaningful. And then for philanthropy, um, you know, there are things that government's not going to fund. And one of the things that philanthropy can do um, is not only to fund some of those things, um, like maybe community networks, but also um, to um, strategically get in there and help advocates understand the opportunity that they have to go to, to government with demands. Um, so, you know, philanthropy can sometimes be a catalyst for getting people together and, and getting those those demands and asks on the table. And so I would really encourage the, that the philanthropic community to look at this as a, a strategic opportunity to have huge impact to unlock those federal funds and those state funds. Um, by working with, you know, folks who are probably already your grantees. Thank you for that. And I just want to note, Greta will be um, departing in a few minutes. So if there are any questions specific for Greta, go ahead and put them in the Q&A. Monique, um, talk to us about what the role is, just to pick up on where Greta left off, that role for communities and local advocates. Thank you. Um, I think the role, one of the key roles for community members are to continue to become educated. Um, and most importantly in digital literacy skills because we have to, that's the only way that we can engage in anything and more and more, we don't even have opportunities of face-to-face -face or uh, going somewhere and, and, and trying to write a letter or leave it or make a phone call. So we have to become um, educated so we then can use our voice and uh, take advantage of digital literacy opportunities. But as they are communicated and made available, those opportunities for the advocates, their work is to make the information easily accessible and well-known. So go to where the people are. It, as Greta said earlier, it's not make it and they'll come. If, if, you know, libraries are one of my best places and I love them, but the whether it's be the digital navigators or um, administration in libraries understand that their staff has to go outside of that environment to engage with community and bring them back in. So attending various events around your libraries, or uh, if you are an advocate in another way, if you have funding and you've created flyers that just basically talk about safety and some of the basic things that you need to do um, with your telephone, because 
many people just get an app like, oh, I just need that app. But you've read nothing about that app. You wouldn't automatically take your phone and turn it over to, you know, a, a, a significant other and say, OK, now I want you to read all my text messages and all my emails and look at every single picture on my phone. Well, we just gave that right to such and such when we downloaded their app or did something. So being fully aware of what it is we're doing and that we're um, giving away. So if we have advocates maybe identifying, I call them kicker cards. They're those little cards that you see when they're advertising parties or um, some type of service, but dropping those in local bodegos, restaurants, um, cleaners, uh, places where we know people are going so that they then can not only see about you and that you're offering those services, but maybe on one side of the card, you just gave them 10 tips to safety. How do you also, in the age that we're in, fight against all of the misinformation that we're continuously faced against. And over the course of this next year, as we're building up to the election, we're going to be faced with um, an insurmountable amount of false information. And we don't necessarily even understand that it's false because it sounded like such and such said it. I saw that person and you know they had this title. So just even on uh, helping people to understand how they, uh, you know, offering classes in literacy in that way that specifically speak to how do we identify when it's, um, you know, not a live person <laughs> that's uh, saying these things or speaking this to us. So the community has the responsibility to become educated as much as possible and speak up, use our voice for public comments and request for what we what we know that we deserve because communication is a fundamental human right. And that's what the internet is. Everyone should receive it. And as I said, advocates, we have the responsibility to continue to teach and make information available to our general public. And especially make sure we're touching every element of the public, children, um, young adults, uh, middle-aged adults with families and seniors. We've got to hit every part of the population. And because our most vulnerable are our seniors and our children. They're being targeted yeah. the most online as well. Thank you for that. Um, Greta, I'm looking at the time and just want to offer you if there's one last thought you want to leave folks with. Um, you know, I saw a question in the chat about state libraries, um, and I, I want to just lift it up um, to say that state libraries and public libraries overall have been doing this work. Um, they do this work every single day. They are um, our best experts in the needs out there. And um, I think there are a million ways <laughs> that we can look to libraries um, in the implementation process um, and continue to learn from them. So that's that's my last word. Thank you so much. Thank you, Greta. And thanks for being with us today. All right. Well, you know, Monique, listening to you, I think it's also really interesting, right? Just the shift in perspective of like where we are versus BTOP. And even prior to that, the Technology Opportunities Program, which was a decade before, where the work was really about convincing people about the value of technology and convincing folks to see low-income communities as, you know, um, as folks that should be a part of that experience. And now we're at this point where it's not so much the convincing, well, it's still there, I know, but now it's about what's happening in the adoption and like, how are we safeguarding and protecting folks? It's much more complex today. And, and I think that's an important thing to note um, from where we were just 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, in our last few minutes, uh, Julia and Monique, I think it would be great to hear from you all just, you know, as folks are pursuing this, like what more can they be thinking about um, in terms of, you know, approaches to building digital equity initiatives that will, you know, extend beyond the next five years. And I think that, you know, things that come to mind are, you know, what what would be fundable um, in this scenario? I think Greta started to identify some things. And how do you, you know, how do you go about that um, and if there's any kind of specific um, resources or partnerships or approaches that you would recommend as folks embark on this or are already embarked on it, like how they can continue uh, to evolve their approach. 
I'm gonna start with you, Juliet. Thanks. Um, so um, I think that the most important thing that we'll see and that came out of BTOP and also I think we're gonna see again in the digital equity funds that come through um, are the need for these coalitions and partnerships. So one of the ways I think to build lasting programs is to develop, if you haven't yet, those coalitions or partnerships um, and think about ways to seed it. And I'll give an example. So after the BTOP um, funding ended, one of the things that um, we did was we created something called the Technology Learning Collaborative. It didn't have any funding. Um, it was like five of us who were previously funded by BTOP in the nonprofit sector, who were able to continue to do some programming, who would meet, we started to meet monthly for like lunch meetings, essentially. Um, and it was all volunteer and we had somebody from the library. We had someone, we got someone from the government to come in. And I see a question around how do you get government involved? And I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, and, um, we offered, um, sort of like small, uh, training, like for digital inclusion practitioners over the course of a year. So it was very, very small. We started you know, pretty small. And then we started to host a conference. We got a, a grant, a small grant, I think it was $5,000 from Comcast um, to host a conference that brought together. So like that, most of the activity that we did was engaging in a listserv and hosting a conference to like gather who's in the room, who's interested in this work, what do they want to hear, what do they want to learn? And so even that level of work is really, really critical, I think, in developing and preparing for funding. Um, you also, some of that happened as funding appeared because until we see the guidance for the funding, it's a little bit hard to know exactly what you're going to have to do. But I think we can expect things like, um, you know, uh, programmatic wide digital literacy or digital skill programs that will want to be funded. And and I would suggest that folks think that there's not one right way to do that, that you build your coalition so that local trusted partners get some of that money and they can do digital skills in the way that they know will meet the needs of their particular um, uh, folks in their community that they serve. Um, so digital skills we're gonna see, obviously devices, that's gonna be a big one. Devices are expensive and so I actually think that there should be other funding and hopefully we'll see some other funding come out that are directly around device uh, distribution and purchasing and that we don't have to spend all of our money eating up on devices. Um, but that could be something that's built into, into the programming that folks should consider. Um, I hope that we'll see things like innovative solutions like mesh networks or sort of community built networks um, in some of that funding, it should be allowable. And so there could be some real great opportunities there that you could see in a coalition or a neighborhood community group um, or um, some of our, our, you know, tied to um, uh, neighborhood revitalization programs that kind of Kind of can attach themselves to that funding because they're already doing some of this work. We're seeing this happen already um, in in some of the cities that they're already doing some of this work. Um, I think we're also going to see funding for things like um, obviously digital navigators. That's a big one. We're going to see funding for that. So those are the types of programs I expect to see funded through the digital equity funds that will come out both from the states and directly from the federal government. And the more you can be, build a coalition of like five, 10, 15 organizations collectively with a, you know, perhaps a lead fiscal agent kind of taking in the money and then redistributing it, the better off I think you will be. And sometimes that will be city government, but sometimes city government is not the right entity. And so I just wanna finish by answering this one question in the comments about if you don't have a dedicated position for digital equity in your municipal government, what to do. I would say that um, seek out which department might have the best champion. And obviously if the municipal government also funds or the library is housed under that government, that's the number one place I would look. The number two place I would look is the workforce or adult education system that is funded through that municipal government. Um, they likely have a lot of 
um, experience funding programs already for digital inclusion and digital skills. So they probably have people who care about that and can champion it. Um, and then there might be, I mean, through us, it came from the, from the Office of Innovation and Technology. So there might be like an innovation team, a smart cities person. Um, those are the kinds of, of departments that might be doing some of this work. Um, you might also though find it in really interesting places, like um, if they're doing reentry work. There's a lot of really interesting things happening in the reentry space um, around digital skills and reentry and job. It, the connection between digital skills and jobs is very, very strong as an economic argument. And so there's a lot of thinking in city government around that too. That's really helpful. Thank you so much, Juliet. Monique, let's hear from you on this. Absolutely, thank you. I'd be remiss if I didn't, um, and thank you too for calling out community networks, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention, you know, my anchor, the Equitable Internet Initiative. And I think that those that, um, funding community networks, and they've expanded tremendously across the country because they are viable solutions, um, especially when, we, though we may not suffer some of the infrastructure uh, circumstances that rural areas do, we still have a lot of dark fiber, even though it may be there in the ground because it's it, redlining does not permit it to be provided for every community. It is still very, very profit driven. Um, so there are still disparities and inequity when it comes to that. But um, allowing funding to go towards the building of community networks, um, it helps to, increase that neighborhood's opportunities, not only just the neighborhood, but the individuals that are there. Because when individuals are taught skills on how to do that, they have just increased their worth and value um, in the job sector because they will be committed to doing this for their communities and vested in it, but also now significantly trained in skills. So externally, it can be used as an opportunity to. Um, for them to be able to participate in the workforce at a higher pay scale or higher level, because we have many, many people who are working more than one job, but they are still in poverty um, because just of how our environments are set up and established. So allowing money to go towards, uh, towards that and people becoming more engaged in um, community network building. We have cities still that have prohibitions against having community networks, period. And uh, those kinds of things need to leave because um, as Greta spoke about earlier, this is all relational. It's about relationships. And these opportunities are perpetuated by being able to participate in our economy. So um, just working together collectively, I think is, one of the great areas and opportunities that we have for solutions. Thank you, Monique. We have um, one question, additional question in the Q&A here. Having seen big pots of funds come and go in the past, what do you recommend when it comes for planning for the future post Digital Equity Act? Um, what do we have to say to this? I think we've said a lot in this regard, but if there's any last thoughts here. Oh, go ahead, Monique. I, and it'll be, and I'll try to make this quick because one one area, though we have a big pot of funds, I think we have to continue to assess where those funds go because one thing I didn't speak to, and that was internet service providers. They have a role to play in terms of because in establishing community networks, you need an internet connection, and for them to participate in what I call digital philanthropy, which is meaning that you are donating bandwidth to these community networks so that they can be um, sustained. It's a write-off you know, for them and uh, for the donations that they've made to the community. And the areas where the community networks are being built are not areas where they're vying to be anyway, because mm -hmm. they generally are not meeting their thresholds for 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 revenue. So being able to donate that and uh, because the significant, yes, I love that ACP is here, Affordable Connectivity Program, and people can enroll and be able to get a subsidized cost, but that's a lot of money too that they are making. And um, they aren't completely taking, taking it into consideration how much more they could be doing because, you know, they're upselling people instead of just the $30 a month 
don't do that. Allow people, you know, go ahead and donate and give it away, but take more responsibility though, too, as far as data capture is concerned mm. and protecting the data, not just taking and using it and selling it and making it um, another pocket of uh, income for you, but give back to the community, help people to understand when their data is being tapped into, because I know they know, and uh, just bringing us into that fold so that we are not as susceptible and vulnerable. Mm. And the ACP is not, not promised for a long time either. So oh. yeah, Julia, you were well, going to say something summer. there. I, I just want to, I think this issue of sustainability is a really, really big challenge we have. Digital equity doesn't have like a federal office in the same way, right? Like it's not seen like workforce or adult ed that has like buckets that you get every year, housing, like some of these other issues, right? You get a bucket and it gets still, like, we don't have that level of sustainable funding. We should be advocating for that level. And I think NDIA is starting to do this, um, but we don't have, we're, we, we don't have that yet. Um, so it's really the sustainability piece is really a challenge. Um, this what we are on is like a long journey, not a short journey. Right. As you can see, for many of us who've been doing it for a long time and we're going to be making progress over the years. And there may be times when we have to backtrack and hopefully we learn from some of those things like we're doing now. Um, so one of the things I would recommend in terms of how to plan for the future is to know what your costs are going to be, right? And be very clear about your budgets, right? So if you know, and like, because this work is really people intensive, it is not like one time you're going to build it. And, you know, digital literacy training is very, digital navigation is very people intensive. It takes time and those people have to be funded to do that work. Um, and so when you think about it, you have to really be clear about like, what are those costs what what do you really want and make a clear um, demand. This is my advocacy side hat coming on, right? Like make a clear demand about how much you actually need to do that work. Um, and then very clearly be articulating that to government because ultimately government is probably the best, most stable source of funding and they have the power to say tax or do other things that can bring in revenue. So, you know, they are the ones who are going to help you do that. We need a lot of different sectors involved in this, um, and they need to. We need to be thinking creatively about how they can be involved in this um, and where that revenue comes from them to be involved in it. Um, but ultimately, it's probably a policy issue where it comes back to government to to um, to to tweak that hand to like gently say this is how it's going to have to happen <laughs> down the road. Thank you. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to have to bring this conversation to a close and bring Karen on. And I just want to say a big thank you to Juliet and Monique and also to Greta, who's who's left us briefly in this conversation. We'll catch up with her another time. I'm going to bypass reading to you Karen's bio. You will all receive it in the links. But Karen, I want to bring you into this and respond to what you've heard today. Um, you've been in the work of research and evaluation and and looking at this from that perspective. And you have a very interesting lens on this from what the data says and what the national view is. Can you just, um, just share with us your thoughts on today's conversation? Sure, well, first of all, thanks. It's an honor to be invited here today. And I'd like to thank all the panelists for the great discussion today. I'm going to, as you said, just add some observations from research. On, on some of the themes that emerge today. And I think um, observations that echo insights that have been shared by the panelists. Um, the central theme of course has been that as states and also local governments and tribes are putting together their plans, it's important to reflect on lessons from the past. And one of those lessons from past policies at both the federal and at the state levels um, is that they've often focused on partial solutions such as infrastructure for rural areas. The experience of the pandemic taught us that uh, solutions this time need to be more holistic. 
And while past research has shown some positive effects for broadband availability, this is just one piece of the puzzle. Recent research that I did with Carolyn Tolbert and Scott Lacombe demonstrates with nearly two decades worth of subscription data on, on broadband in metros and in counties that it's inclusive broadband use, it's widespread adoption in communities beyond infrastructure that has an even stronger economic impact than this availability. And these are impacts over time in both urban and rural communities, um, impacts for median income, employment, multiple measures of prosperity. And this widespread inclusive broadband adoption use can also affect more than the economy. Um, for example, the percentage of the population with broadband subscriptions also matters over time for economic, um, sorry, for educational outcomes in communities, as some other research that I've collaborated on has shown. So broadband use has these spillover benefits for communities and society. It's broadband use um, that benefits society as well as individuals participating online. It's a form of digital human capital. This human capital is not distributed evenly across communities, but disparities are both urban and rural. When the American Community Survey first released data for all census tracts in 2017, there were zip codes in Memphis with only a quarter of the population with any kind of broadband subscription, including mobile. And similar to Wheeler County, Georgia, uh, and Navajo Nation at the time. As the Brookings Institution has shown, the affordability gap, and that's for connections and devices, accounts for a much larger share of disparities than the infrastructure gap. So, what lessons can we draw about? how we can bring about real change this time. And I think that's a lot of what the discussion has been today. I've also seen too, during BTOP, I evaluated Chicago Smart Communities, which was an outreach and training program. And one of the things we learned was that community-based organizations that worked in partnership with local government ended up having a real impact. Um, using citywide surveys over a span of five years with neighborhood level data, we found that the nine Chicago community areas that participated in the program showed significantly greater changes over time than the other Chicago neighborhoods for internet use, for home broadband adoption, for some activities online, not all of them, but for things like job search and health and mass transit information. And this was controlling for other factors like demographic change. These results were noteworthy because the funding that Chicago received, like other major cities, just as Juliet mentioned, was for outreach and training and public access. And there was little to address the problem of affordability for low-income households. Yet it was still possible to move the needle given a substantial mobilization of outreach and effort. While the city was the grantee, implementation was through community-based organizations, and it was supported by Chicago LISC. The neighborhood level leadership was important, we could see in the evaluation, because as the program rolled out, there was a need to customize the training to fit different needs across neighborhoods. In some where there was little familiarity with the internet, among participants and in others where many were frequent users outside the home. We could see these differences in the citywide surveys by neighborhoods as well. Uh, there were also differences across communities in how outreach was conducted uh, at mass on Sunday or at the barber shop. The lead organizations were often groups with experience in affordable housing rather than technology but they were trusted leaders in the communities. And in interviews, at the beginning and the end, we saw how these organizations experienced changes in their attitudes about technology 
and its possibilities. Um, so I think one of the accomplishments was further developing this local leadership on the issue. The smart communities also included substantial collaboration uh, with the state and the MacArthur Foundation and community foundations as well. Um, sorry about that. Um, the Chicago Sh uh, Community Trust. But this was a short-term effort, as Juliet mentioned, and there was little to support affordable adoption. Um, we can see from later data in the American Community Survey that not all the smart community neighborhoods sustained these gains several years later. Um, I hope that today they're in a better position to resume their efforts. So I want to end up by saying current federal solutions are more comprehensive than in the past than in, in BTOP, and they include more flexibility as tomorrow's panel will show. But all of that will depend on implementation. States are critical actors. There are funds for digital equity and affordable connectivity this time, but the future for those who are uncertain. Lessons that can be drawn from the past are that first, it will be important for states to support needs across all their communities, both urban and rural. Second, that local governments need to partner with community-based organizations anchor institutions, foundations, nonprofits, the private sector, and more. And third, this must include sustainable solutions for affordability and use, as well as infrastructure. Um, I'm just going to mention that another lesson from the past that will be discussed further on Thursday is the need for evaluation. There's more and better data this time, and it will be important to invest in evaluation to examine these many initiatives across the country and to find out what works. This is a watershed moment for shaping what the broadband future will be. And it's a critical time to learn from the past and to prepare to learn as much as we can from the present, to build for gains meant to last this time. Thank you, Karen. That was terrific. And for folks who are furiously trying to capture what she was saying in your notes, there will be a recording for this, the entire panel. I want to welcome back Becca Kwan, who is going to help us close out today's session. And a big thank you to all who have joined. Um, Becca? Absolutely. Thank you so much to our speakers and to everyone who joined us today. I wanna to give you a little preview of tomorrow's session before we go. We're excited to welcome the Digital Equity Director for NTIA, Angela T. Bennett, as our keynote speaker, and to have a panel discussion with Jordana Barton-Garcia, Juan Muro Jr., uh, and H. Trostel, uh, moderated by Lauren Moore. The link is in the chat if you'd like to register. And we just want to say thank you so much and have a great evening.